Welcome, knights and nobles, to the unrelenting horrors of Aya, because today we are talking about the various sub-factions of the 100 Kingdoms. I just did a video on them yesterday, really going into more depth about sort of their origin story, and I pointed out that this is the story of the 100 Kingdoms, not the story of mankind. And so we're going to focus specifically on the events that led them as they crossed over the mountain ranges over to the west by the Bitter Sea, how they went from a bunch of refugees to a huge, huge, huge collection of individuals, warlords, fiefdoms, and kingdoms to become the army that you and I get to play with on the tabletop. Now, one thing I'd like to add up top is that if you like this video and you're interested in this faction, please consider using my affiliate link in the description below. It'll save you 10% on all your purchases through Parabellum and goes a super long way to helping support me, my wife, and this channel. So thank you so much to all the people who have already done that. Now, in my part one, just as a short, brief synopsis, uh, these are the ordinary men and women of the setting that are armed with little more than faith sometimes and a dull sword, out here fighting every kind of monster imaginable. But there's a lot going on because of the fractious nature of humanity and the evolution of their society from this primal feudalism at first to a massive system of interconnected kingdoms with politics and religion and more. So today we are going to take a brief dive into the various sub-factions of the 100 kingdoms and get you a sense of, of what the various influences and forces for these guys are like. And keep in mind, and I want to say this right up top, any given kingdom within the 100 kingdoms is going to feel pressure from all of these sub-factions. It's not like you pick your one and that's a whole city's devoted to that. One faction may, of course, be the primary, you know, modus operandi of an entire kingdom, but collectively, the influences from every single one of these is going to be felt in every single kingdom. And so we're going to start our discussion with the orders. And again, this is where I point out that the history of humanity is much more than the history of the 100 kingdoms. The orders are descended from a military legion that safeguarded humanity as it fled west, away from the Dominion. Now, the reason for that will be explained in a dedicated video, but a single legion from the many that existed survived that dark time and set itself up to defend humanity in this strange new world by the Bitter Sea. So you have these warriors of incredible power that are brave and honorable, but they don't have a government all of a sudden. They have no social structure, and so they're trying to defend everybody, but they're like, things are falling apart very aggressively, and so... It's just this problem where people didn't want to be governed by soldiers because that's just martial law, nor did this remaining legion want the responsibility of governing alone. Because even internally, they were disagreeing on how best to guide and defend humanity. So what you and I call the orders in conquest are just different factions, all descended from that original legion, who have different ideas on how to lead. Some of them want to lead and defend humanity by the sword, in, in sort of like a, a might makes right mentality, with some others thinking that you know money and social influence are the key to basically unifying humanity. Regardless, these collections of Legion descendants are extremely powerful as a collective faction within the 100 Kingdoms. I mean, there's something about them, the way that they trained their equipment, their discipline, that has given them near superhuman abilities in battle. Like, it, it thoroughly matters that this one military legion had descendants at all. And they work to make sure that neither the nobility, which is just the rich people from all across the 100 Kingdoms, or the church itself, do not fully subjugate the course of human development. They kind of work as a free agent, largely, and whatever they think threatens the greater freedom of the 100 kingdoms, they address it. Right? If someone reports a Dwegholm incursion, the heck you are, and the orders are going to come right down there and stomp it out. And I guess kind of when I think about the orders, I think of them almost like paladins, right? They're these holy warriors who operate as an independent force and can defend humanity and not in holy in a religious sense, but that there is something sort of divine about them. They, their strength and their abilities is far greater than the average person. So there's something about them, but they are also bogged down in the squabbles of how best to achieve the goal of defending humanity, and they are not immune to the pettiness of man. 
And so this kind of, you know, wrestling with their own humanity and, and being sort of demigods on the battlefield, it puts them in this weird place where they're like, we don't just want to have martial law and lead, though they could have at one point. But all of those influences going to making them a super interesting faction, and you can really splash it into any part of your army, right? You just say that they're on their own mission, maybe a, whor a warlord hired them just to kind of help them with deal with a problem with another faction. There's all kinds of reasons why the orders would join an army, but they really do act as sort of their own free agent that you can build upon and expand and bring into your faction, or you can just ignore them. Now the next sub faction we're gonna talk about are the nobility and no human centric faction would be complete without a intense reminder of the fleeting pettiness and short sightedness of mankind. And for that, I present to you the nobility. When the first humans came over mountains and headed west from the dominion, nobility was just, you know, it was, it was some strong air quotes around the word noble. And it was basically defined by whoever could take and hold land, right? Very primal, very might makes right kind of a thing. But as things mellowed out, the orders we mentioned basically went around and cleared out uh, bandit kingdoms and minor warlords and anyone on the level, meaning you could keep a population alive, you could defend your land, you weren't a tyrant outright, you, you know had farmers, workers, and military stuff. Well, they were allowed to remain, thus birthing a new tier of nobility. Lots of landowners, regents, warlords, that kind of thing. And while the orders have been huge in shaping the overall structure of the 100 kingdoms, you know, by defending it and that kind of stuff, and the church has been steadily influencing its citizens' worldviews, no change can happen without two things. Raw manpower and money. And that's where the nobility fit into this kind of ecosystem. They own the land that has the mines. The mines have the ore for making metal. The metal is needed for weapons and armor. They have the fields that provide the food for entire crusades. They hire soldiers and support trade. They facilitate the societies that the church and the orders strive to influence and control. And those are all super awesome things. But the problem is, is that each kind of pocket, I guess you could say, of nobles, because the 100 kingdoms just does not want to unify, each of them is an island unto themselves, convinced that they alone will endure the test of time. If they accrue enough resources or power or social clout, then they can come out on top and reign above the entire 100 kingdoms. In fact, that name, 100 Kingdoms, is a testament to the fickle nature of the nobility because they like things separated because then it becomes a game that can be played and won. There have been times where the 100 Kingdoms were united as a single empire, as I mentioned before, but it keeps falling apart because of the greed and the short-sightedness of nobles and people in the church and even the order themselves. So while they do add a lot to the ongoing growth of humanity as a whole, it's nothing compared to what they would be if they were able to unite. Now the third faction to cover here is that of the faith. And this is kind of a broad term here uh, because it underpins the drama between you know, refugees trying to become nation builders, the orders trying to keep it all together, and, and petty warlords and tyrants trying to assert themselves as nobility. But... Behind all of that is the common everyday man just trying to understand why all of this is happening. And so to service that need for understanding, they turn to the church. And essentially the church is divided into two camps. There's the theist and the deist. And these are essentially two ways of interpreting the tragic events that led to mankind running away from the dominion after the fall and ending up here as refugees having to rebuild themselves as the 100 kingdoms. Now, like I said, we're going to talk about the fall of the dominion in a separate video, but whether or not you know the facts about the fall is irrelevant because what we're talking about is what the churches say happened, of course, and that's, that's a very different thing. So first up, we'll tackle the theists. In their mind, it was mankind that fell from grace, as if we, collectively, were on the wrong path in the before times of the Dominion, and we were essentially cast out by the gods for our transgressions. And 
Much of humanity was wiped out as punishment for those sins, and those that were left alive were the chosen. And we, we have been given a chance to rebuild you know, humanity and society on the foundation of tr the true righteous faith. So there's lots of elements of, you know, guilt, um, inadequacy, that kind of stuff where we have been cast out of the divine place and we need to repent and change and that kind of stuff. So kind of a, a classic, I guess you could say fire and brimstone -y type thing. The other side of the faith are the deists. And so I'm actually just going to read what they wrote about the deists because I think it is probably the best synopsis possible. The deist creed argues that the fall of the divinity was due to mankind and its flawed vision of perception. They argue that God is a perfect distillation of man rather than man being an imperfect copy of God, and that our limited perception of this perfection twisted what was once whole and pure through need and prayer, warping it so badly it fell. They argue that the only way for humanity to worship the divine is by choosing to worship those aspects we each understand and embody the best. Thus, to come closer to divinity, one needs not to be born among the chosen, quote unquote, but to embody the aspects of the divine as closely as possible. So it's a lot less of a, you know, here's an, a fantasy take on history, but rather the true faith is by putting into practice the best values that we can hope to ascend to. But the problem with that as your thesis statement for life and governance is that there is a clear lack of definition, right? I'm all for leaning into self-improvement, but there's not a rigid structure. And so people will always drift away into pockets of intense zealotry around whatever they think the key, you know, trait is. Again, quote, it says, the only way for humanity to worship the divine is by choosing to worship those aspects we each understand and embody the best. That can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And when you magnify that across the number of 100 kingdoms to the number of different deist churches within them, you can understand why there would be a lot of misunderstandings from church to church. But both of these philosophies and religious structures exist simultaneously. They each cater to different types of people and the petty warlords who rule them. Some nobles find it useful as a political tool to align themselves to one or another, and so the power of the church will wax and wane region to region. Also, it's important to remember that because the, the enemies around mankind are only getting more deadly and more like, crazy, I guess you could say, the intensity of these faiths is also on the rise, especially as mankind gets bigger and stronger and able to really ask the hard questions about its own origin. And so the way that the book posits this kind of thing is that wars of faith are on the rise and they are inevitable. There's going to be a day where the deist and theist church have to have it out. Now the last uh, faction, and I'm going to put an asterisk next to that term, uh, are the imperial remnants. So this is sort of like a little side thing. I mentioned a few times in this video and the last that there was a point in time where the 100 kingdoms were unified into one imperial empire. The imperial remnants are one last little group or some measure of military and political power based on that. When that empire collapsed, the imperial military that acted as the centralized forces of the emperor himself refused to disband. And as the unity of the empire crumbled to infighting between the nobility, the orders, and the churches, all those things we talked about, the faithful guard of the emperor himself refused to yield or dissipate. And so what they did was they went to the land that the emperor had owned for himself. Huge cut of land, all that kind of stuff, and they claimed ownership of it. And they basically squatted on that property. And then they did the same thing with the mint, meaning uh, currency production, whoever makes your money. And then they did it again with the halls of learning and knowledge. And so just by retaining these things that any of the 100 kingdoms need to seize absolute power, they had become a power unto themselves. So they kind of act as this reminder of days of unity past, while also ensuring that no one gets a little bit too much power in their pocket. You essentially control the bank, a whole bunch of very valuable land, and the places where learning and, and higher education can happen. 
they don't rule, of course. They don't try to rule. They simply keep things in balance. Because in a way, they are the unofficial means that keep all of the 100 kingdoms on a playing field together. Trade can happen thanks to a unified currency. There is vast wealth to be had from the resources of the Imperial Remnant's lands. The best people can be trained at their academies, and they can even act as judges for lesser disputes. Their leader is known as the Chamberlain, which is a largely honorary title that puts the full might of the Imperial Remnants behind a sole personality. And so I want to end this video like I end all of them asking, why is this so cool? And I think, honestly, you know, after having gone through all four of these sub factions, the real thing that I find interesting is the fact that they all exist simultaneously. Any warlord who controls any kingdom, right? No matter how regal you think you are, whether you're a very noble leader and part of the aristocracy and you're very, you know, benevolent, or you're a tyrant who just works people to death, you are going to feel the influences all four of these sub factions. And then you could, I guess you could call it five sub factions because their church is divided between the theists and the deists. So that's a lot of push and pull. And when we look at things like historical, you know, let's say pre-World War I Europe, you get that same kind of sense. There are so many influences going on at the same time as your society is changing and evolving at an unprecedented pace. Because now we have, you know, trade routes between people. We have a church that can kind of act as a buffer between nation states. There's just a lot of political intrigue and ness. You know, it's just humanity gets very messy when it reaches a certain point. This is that point. And so I like the fact that I feel like the 100 Kingdoms is a snapshot into one of the most interesting points in human history in terms of our actual development in the real world. But it's layered into this fantasy setting where empires are unifying and toppling and, and there's outside threats and inside threats. There's all kinds of stuff going on. And as someone who loves stories and engaging tales and uh, loves that people have the freedom to write their own, it's just an absolute sandbox for all kinds of great storytelling. I'm also a huge sucker for a zealot army. I don't know why it is. Whether it is, you know, um, Menoth from War Machine or like Bone Splitters and Fire Slayers from AOS. I just, I love the idea of just a bunch of really angry zealots just going headlong because it's such a terrifying notion. But friends, that's my thoughts on the sub-factions of the 100 Kingdoms. I hope that you enjoyed this video as much as I did narrating it. Let me know your thoughts about the 100 Kingdoms in the comments down below. I'd love to know which one's your favorites. Again, obviously mine, the priest, the, even just the priest model is just the most baller thing ever. I would love to hear your guys' thoughts on that. So leave it down below. I will catch you next time. Happy Wargaming.